Good morning. Welcome to Rio Rancho United Methodist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Please rise as you are able and join us in singing our opening hymn, number 338 in the United Methodist hymnal, Where He Leads Me. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. How's everyone doing today? (laughs) 
It was a little weak this morning, a little weak, but that's okay. It's a beautiful day outside. Hopefully it doesn't get quite as hot as yesterday. Yesterday was a little bit warm. So just a few announcements this morning. We do have women's book club meeting tomorrow at 1030 in the youth room. We have been reading A Child of My Own by Vanessa Carnival. I really enjoyed the book. So if you um, have been reading the book and want to come and join in the discussion, we will meet at 10.30. If you didn't read the book, but you want to learn a little bit more about what book club's all about, go ahead and come on and meet us and, and greet us, and then we'll talk about another book next month. So um, the Angels Above Home Care is still our August mission emphasis, and there is a box in the narthex that you can put items in. They still are looking for disposable gloves, um, household cleaning spray, uh, wipes, surgical masks, and laundry detergent. And that just helps um, the people that are helping the, the people that are in home health care. So um, if you can bring stuff for that, that would be marvelous. If you take a look over there, there is a quilt, and that quilt is for Gigi McGee, who is a friend of Donna Root, and um, Gigi's mother passed away and so um, that is for Gigi if you can come up and you tie a knot when you say a prayer and then once all those little strings are tied into knots then we will get that to Gigi if you're watching at home and you say a prayer you can just call the church office and we will tie the knot for you so the, the sooner we get those knots tied uh, the sooner that quilt can be enjoyed we have received the new upper room books so uh, they are in the narthex, and there's also some over by the office if you want to pick one of those up. If you're watching at home and you'd like to have one mailed to you, just call the church office and leave your information with Rachel. Let her know whether you want this, this little size or whether you want the big one, which is the larger print edition, and she will mail that to you. Let's see. Um, there is a new Bible study starting, um, the early bird the early birds, they meet at 8.30 in the youth room every Sunday. They're going to start a new Bible study reading through the Bible in a year. So that's a great challenge. So if you'd like to give that a try, come on down and be at church by 8.30 in, instead of at 10 and join the Bible study. Also, the Renewed Hope Free Store is looking for a few more volunteers. The more volunteers we have, the, the um, less often somebody has to work. So if you can help with that, that would be great. And also fellowship. I've reminded you guys a couple times. You know, we, we have fellowship right after worship service. And um, we have snacks over there this morning. It was brought by um, Yvonne's class, right? I think she's, I don't see, yep. <laughs> Yvonne's um, Sunday school class brought fellowship this morning. So thank you for that. If anybody would like to sign up, there's a sign up sheet on the bulletin board in the narthex. So just take a look at that and see when you can bring some snacks. And I think that is all of the announcements. Remember to tear off your little, the little flappy thing and put it in the offering plate along with your offering. And now if you would please join me in the call to worship. We gather in this sacred space to worship and draw closer to the divine. We come together with open hearts and eager spirits. In the Gospel of John, Jesus proclaims, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Let us ponder on this metaphor of connection and growth. Help us to understand the deeper meaning within these words. Just as a vine finds its strength from the source, we too are called to remain rooted in the love and grace of our Creator. Help us recognize our need for this divine connection, longing to be nourished and sustained. As the branches of the true vine, we are invited to bear fruit, the fruits of love, joy, patience, and more. Let these fruits flourish in our lives and relationships. As we sing, pray, and hear your word, let our worship be a celebration of our interconnectedness, a chorus of branches on the true vine. 
With voice united, we join in worship, knowing we are part of a greater whole. Let us bear these fruits not only for ourselves, but to share them with the world, illuminating the path with our kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Let us be vessels of light and love, spreading the blessings we have received. Amen. Our call to prayer this morning is number 2133 in the faith we sing, Give Me a Clean Heart. Uh, we'll sing it one time through, and we invite you all to join in singing with us as you feel called to do so. join me in a word of prayer. Good morning, God. It is gloriously beautiful in your creation today. All the green and, and all of the birds flying around. And if we really look, we can see the butterflies, and they're so amazing. Thank you, Lord, for the rain we've received throughout our state this week. We need it. Thank you for the blessings of that moisture and, and the future blessings that we know it will bring to us because there are parts of our areas, Lord, where irrigation has been cut off for the year unless we get more rain. And we know that those people who are experiencing that are having difficulties. Lord, we come to you this morning as a church family to pray together, and there's so much to pray for, Lord. Please help us to understand that wherever we are, we can pray. We can pray for 10 seconds, or we can pray for an hour. It doesn't matter. It's all beautiful to you, Lord. And please help us to understand also, you don't get tired of our asking. You know that we are your children and we need help. And you're there whether we ask or not. But help us to recognize you being there with us. Lord, we pray this morning for all those who are grieving. We pray for all those who are sick, whether it's mental or physical, emotional. We pray that they can feel your love surrounding them and gain strength from that love and healing. We pray, Lord, this morning for the people of Jacksonville, Florida, who have just experienced a terrible tragedy yesterday. We pray that somehow we can wrap our minds around how to deal with this senseless violence that happens in our country. We know that there are always going to be violent people, Lord, but there are things that we can do to help tamper that violence so that we see what's happening. We notice people. Sometimes, Lord, we can go through our whole days and not even notice a single person around us. And that's not right. You want us to see each other. You want us to help each other. Please guide us, Lord. Help us to be open to new things and to learning, no matter what our age. We come to you this morning, Lord, with many people in our hearts and on our minds. And we ask that you bless them. I'd like to lift to you this morning, Mary Ann and Judy. Are there others? Lord, we ask that you just hold tight to these people that we've named and to those we've named in our hearts. Help them to open their hearts enough 
to know that you're there, to know that they're never, ever alone. And Lord, we ask for wisdom and empathy and compassion for all of our law enforcement, and that they may be safe, and that our first responders who rush into places we would never want to go can be safe and blessed and know that they're appreciated. And Lord, in our country, we have a vast medical machine. And it takes so many. Every single job it takes to run that medical machine, we ask for blessings upon them, Lord. And we ask, Lord, to be open enough to understand. Sometimes we pray and we, we ask for blessings on those who serve others. Please help us to understand that each of us, in our own way, is of service to someone. If you start looking at all the jobs, Lord, at all the families, at all of the friends, each of us provides service to at least one other person. Please help us to understand that and to grow that, Lord. And we come to you this morning, Lord, as a Christian family, once again praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
mean, I liked it all. I liked it. Let's pray. <laughs> Creator, we thank you for this day. And we thank you that we have this place to worship you and to be together as your family. So open our hearts, our minds, our, our ears, and our spirits that we would hear your word. And help us. Help us to recognize if there's a change that we need to make to be a better disciple. May the words of my mouth be true and bring you glory. Amen. So we're at the end of our series on the seven I am statements from the Gospel of John. And I'm going to remind you for the last time there is a major difference between magnetic north and true north. Most compasses use magnetic north, and it is not the same as true north. Our world, our culture, is going to try and pull you off God's true north. It might not seem like much in the beginning, maybe just a degree or two, but if you aren't following true north, you could end up in a place you never intended. And my understanding is that is where some of us are. We are off. We, were, we are in a place we do not want to be, whether because of health issues or financial stress or emotional burnout, we are not on true north. And so this series is to help you get back on true north, where God wants you to be. And I will admit there have been times in my life when I wake up and say, what am I doing here? How, how did I get here? And it was, it was right after my divorce. I was footloose and fancy free. Kids were gone. I was friends with younger women who made a big deal of the dating scene. I still went to church every Sunday, but substituted dates and girls' night out for keeping up with my relationship with Christ. After all, I was back in school and taking several religious classes, but looking back, I realize there is a big difference between learning about Jesus and connected to Jesus. You, you can know about Jesus and actually not know Jesus. It's not a, a question of not wanting to be disconnected. You just feel disconnected from God, from Yeshua. And if this describes you, this message is for you as we look at the seventh I am statement Jesus makes about himself. This I am statement in the 15th chapter of John is all about being connected to him. How do you do that? I am the true vine. Again, he uses the adjective true to remind us that there are other vines you can try and connect your life to, hoping to produce something good in your life, and, and they're actually fake. They're going to leave you on empty. So Jesus says, only I am the true vine. A, verse, a few verses later, he says, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And remain means to abide or, or connect. One has to stay connected to the vine. When Yeshua uses the word vine, the Greek word is very specific. Not just any vine, but a grape vine. Here in New Mexico, we are blessed to have about 60 wineries and tasting rooms throughout the state. I even have three grape vines in my backyard. Now, in Jesus' day, there were vineyards everywhere. So when the disciples are listening to Jesus and hear him say, no vine can produce fruit if they're not connected to the vine, their response is, uh, duh, we already know that. Tell us something we don't know. 
So Jesus goes on and tells them what he really wants them to know. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. What Jesus is saying is apart from me, apart from being connected to me, you cannot produce fruit. We are told throughout all scripture is this. Staying connected to Jesus is the only way your life will produce fruit. And this is a bold statement in and of itself, but the context in which Jesus made this statement adds to the weight of it. So let's look at the context. Many times when we, when we read what Jesus said, we, we don't really know where he is. In this section, we know where he was at because in chapters 13 and 14, we learn he's having um, supper with his disciples. He's in the upper room in Jerusalem. Then in chapters 16 and 17 and 18, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. He's arrested, and the next day he's crucified. So here's a map of Jerusalem while Jesus was alive. Technology. Okay. There is the upper room, right there. And so he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane, so he goes up around here, and there's the garden. And what does he have to pass by? The temple. The temple. The temple in Jerusalem was the center of all religious activity. That was where you went to connect to God. You would bring a sacrifice or an offering, and this was at the center of everything that they did. You had to do something for God, and so this is where everyone thought you had to go to connect with God. So as they're walking, he says, I am the true vine. Now, in the writings of Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, he is quoted as um, PBS. I looked up PBS show Frontline. And this is what um, Josephus said. Writing about the temple, Josephus describes the temple facade as covered with massive plates of gold and writes that a huge large gold vine hung with golden fruit above the large door leading to the inner sanctum. Another source describes the magnitude of the grapes, and he records that it, its beauty was such that it was known as a marvel of size and artistry to all who saw what costliness of material it had been constructed. What one couldn't walk past the temple and miss this massive vine with clusters of grapes hanging from it. Now, why would you have grapes hanging from the temple? At that time, in that place, Israel, a vine with grapes symbolized happiness, blessing, vitality, all the things they wanted in life and the things God had promised to them. Hanging them on the temple door meant this is where you can come to get that. Jesus is literally walking past the, temp the temple with his disciples and could point and say, do you see that? I'm the vine. I'm the only way you can produce fruit. It's still true for us today. Think about grapes and vineyards. They still represent blessing and happiness. When something good, great happens, sometimes we're at a table and we make a toast. Think about a wedding. A toast, and what's in the glass? Wine, usually sparkling wine, but wine or juice. We're toasting using vine and grape to say something amazing is happening. 
or, or giving a blessing to, for the new family or the new house or the promotion. But the point is this. When you think about a vine, it symbolizes happiness, blessing, and joy. It, when we talked about the Good Shepherd, it was a little bit difficult to identify with that because we're not that familiar with sheep. So I explained about those stupid little guys. Now we're talking about a vine and what comes from it and a lot more people are going to be able to relate to wine, right? Okay, nervous laughter, got it. <laughs> It's not a sin to, to drink a glass of wine. It's a sin to get drunk, so we're okay. Wine symbolizes what we want in life. Happiness, blessing, and joy, and peace. Isn't that what you want out of life? The fruit which is coming out of your life, your relationships, your marriage, your kids, your career, your finances. We want great, good fruit to come from out of those things. Jesus is passing by the temple and says, that can only come from me. Then he repeats himself and ups the ante in verse, uh, verse 5 of chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you've ever seen a grapevine, um, specifically the vine, the vine is significant. The branches are just like little itty bitty twigs, kind of insignificant. What is that saying to us? Without Jesus, we will never find significance in this life. These little tiny branches coming off of the vine can produce so many grapes. Jesus goes on to say this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. He finishes by saying something pretty outstanding. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nada, ndaga, zilch, no mas. What's he saying? If you're taking notes, apart from me, you can do nothing being disconnected. You'll produce nothing, like nothing, absolutely nothing. Some people confess they don't believe Jesus is God's son, but they believe he's a good guy, a good moral teacher. Time to push back. Listen, if you listen to what Jesus says about himself, he just said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, can you imagine your husband coming home from work and saying, woman, apart from me, you can do nothing? Would you call him good? <laughs> no. <laughs> so Jesus is either saying he is either who he said he was or when he was a wacko. And I'm not sure what the religious term for wacko is, but you understand wacko. Sometimes it is easy to question this verse. Are you being serious? I can literally do nothing apart from you? I, I, I don't mean to sound sacrilegious and don't strike me with lightning. I'm just trying to understand this. But I feel like I do a lot of things without you. I got up this morning, took a shower, and got dressed. Didn't even ask you for help. I've gone to Seasons and ordered a bowl of lobster bisque because I love their lobster bisque. And I didn't ask you. And, and you know this because you know everything. But I recently sewed 20 quilt squares. 
It's a new pattern, and sometimes I pray my squares will be even. This time I didn't, not once. Not when I was cutting, not when I was sewing them together. I, I didn't ask once. And I did it. They came out great. And sometimes, before yesterday, sometimes I, I prayed Bubba Wallace would win a NASCAR race, which means I was actually praying against Ty Gibbs. I have good news. God's on my side. <laughs> Bubba Wallace is in the playoffs. <laughs> and I made that decision without consulting him. So why do you say I can do nothing apart from you? Really? Let me explain what the word nothing means, which helped me and hopefully will help you understand it better. Nothing. A quantity of no importance. Worthless. Nothing in the original language means a quantity of no importance or worthless. So hear what Jesus is telling us. He's saying you can attempt to accomplish all sorts of things in life. Without me, at the end of your life, it will be worth absolutely nothing. My prayer is at one point in your life, you realize all the things that you're chasing, which you think are going to make you happy and worth something at the end of your life, without Jesus, I promise you, they are worth nothing. Apart from Jesus, you will never have anything good or worthwhile in your life. The peace, the joy, the happiness you're actually seeking. So what is he telling us? He's saying you are designed by God to stay connected to him. That's the only way you will see any kind of, of good fruit produced in your life. All the things you want, they only come when you are connected to Jesus. When a car manufacturer designs a car, you, you get an instruction manual when you buy the car. If a car is designed to run on unleaded gas, and you decide to put water or diesel in it, it's not going to work. God, as your creator and designed, designer, designed you only to find fruit, peace, and fulfillment through him, when you are connected to him. Listen, we were designed with a God hole, a God-shaped hole in our heart. We all were. We have a hole in our heart. We know it. We try and fill our lives with things that we think will fill that void. So what do we do? We try and fill our lives with the things that we'll, we think will make us happy or complete. Sometimes we turn to the things money can buy. I need to have a bigger balance on my bank account. Then I would be happy. It could make our marriage better or a bigger house, or a newer car, things money can buy. Or, or maybe we turn to power and influence. If we can get that promotion, move up the ladder, maybe more followers on Instagram, we see those other people and they look so happy. If that doesn't work, we turn to sex and pleasure. Or, or maybe we chase after a perfect marriage partner. If I just had the right spouse, I would be happy. Let me, let me ask you, all the married folk here, has your spouse met every need in your life? That would be a no. 
They weren't designed to be. Now, I have been married for a while. I would say I'm, I'm a happily married woman most of the time. I, I know I would be lost without Craig, and he better say the same thing. But marriage isn't designed so we answer our partner's every single need, and we have a hole. Then what happens if none of these things work? Then we probably turn to a substance because there is pain in our lives, there's anxiety and depression. We look for help to help us handle the pain or, or make the pain go away. So we turn to a, a substance, a bottle, or a pill. We want to numb the pain. We know there is a void. We feel it. And I want to acknowledge there are circumstances over which we had no control sometimes. A sexual encounter with someone you trusted, and you were just a kid, or a rape. Maybe someone abandoned you, possibly a parent. Or your spouse left you and ran off with someone else. The hole that was already there and you're trying to fill suddenly gets bigger. You know it's affecting you because you want the relationships in your life to go well. The pain from past influences the way you trust your partner or your parenting. Jesus talks into our lives. There's only one thing you can fill your life with which will give you the fruit you need and want and fill that hole, and that is me. If you're not seeing the fruit you want in your life, maybe you're connecting your life to things which don't fulfill. Here is a truth. What you're connected to determines what fruit comes from you. Whatever fruit you see coming from your life is simply a byproduct of what you're connected to. And without Jesus, you will never see the fruit you want, ever. Jesus says it so clearly because the next words out of his mouth are, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Some of you maybe think your life is withering in front of your very eyes. You're just trying to hold on to it. But like ashes, when everything gets burned, it's just slipping through your fingers. When you're not seeing the fruit you want to see in your life, you have to ask a question. Am I connected to Jesus? Are you 100% sure, without a doubt, you're connected to Jesus? Are you sure? If you're not sure, look at the fruit being produced in your life. Not the, not the stuff you post on social media, which makes your life look like it's perfect. Because behind closed doors, there are tears and anxiety and anger and worry. And not the financial fruit. Some of us are financially successful, and you have no worries in this area, and you think your wealth is evidence of your fruit. How many of you know you can have a full bank account and an empty heart? Why? Because money can't buy you a, a great marriage. Money can't help your kids as a substitute for parenting. Money, no matter how much you spend, will alleviate your anxiety. It's only when you are connected to Jesus that you will see the fruit you want in your life. So what kind of fruit are we talking about here? 
What kind of fruit do we want to produce if we are connected to Christ? I am saying it is not financial. Scripture makes it crystal clear what kind of fruit we will produce if we are connected to Jesus. Ephesians 5, 23 and 24, we've heard this before, and I would encourage you and me to memorize this list. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does this describe the kind of fruit you're seeing in your life right now? In your marriage, is there all kinds of love? In your household, is there joy? When you go to bed at night, is there peace? With your kids or, or your, your partner, is there patience? Are you kind? Is there goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Nobody is perfect at this list. But in general, are these the kinds of things coming out of your life? Let me clarify something. Fruit isn't a test of your salvation. It is simply a byproduct. And, and this is something you just can't make up your mind and say, okay, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do better. Honey, I'm going to love you better. Kids, I'm going to be more patient with you. And I'm going to work harder at handling my anxiety. I mean it. I'm going to work harder at this. What is Jesus telling us? That's not how it works. Does a branch wake up every day and say, I'm going to produce some fruit today? No. What does a branch do? It just stays connected to the vine, and that's how it produces fruit naturally. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing on our own. It's not from us. When you read the entire chapter of John, one word will keep popping up. Remain. Remain. Eleven times Jesus uses the word remain. Why? Because unless we are truly, without a shadow of a doubt, connected to Jesus, we will never, never, ever see the fruit we want. You might see it for an hour, but it's gone tomorrow. Who is Jesus? We've been talking about this all month. Who is Jesus? He's the resurrection and the life. He's the good shepherd. He can guide you. He is the light and he is the vine. I believe that there are three groups of people here today. I'm going to describe them to you and I want you to put yourself in one of those buckets. And then I'm going to challenge you to do something about it. Every one of you. Every one of you. First group of people. You are committed to Jesus and are seeing fruit. You're not perfect. It's not every day. You realize with Jesus' help, you're going to do it. You have peace, joy. Even in the midst of everything going on, you can still find some joy. You made a decision to be connected to Jesus and you are seeing some fruit. Here's your challenge. Start leading others to the same hope you've found. Invite others to join you here. Or, or maybe you need to step up and lead. One of my daily prayers for Rio Rancho United Methodist Church is there is growth in discipleship evidenced by giving, attendance, and service. We have ministries which need help, your help. The fruit you produce isn't just for you. You know what happens when you keep all the fruit for yourself? It rots. 
When you produce fruit, you are designed to give, to serve others, to lead and help others. The second group of people would say this. We're connected, but we've broken away. There was a moment in time when you did make a decision to follow Jesus, but like a branch that has been broken, you aren't connected anymore, and you know it. So what's your challenge? Time to reconnect to Jesus. How? Read his word. Pray. Join a small group, a Sunday school. Do you guys have room in your Sunday school classes for up more? Or, or maybe an Emmaus reunion group if you've been on a walk. I do not know how you can be connected to Jesus without real community and being a part of a like-minded community. Church is important, but you're all sitting in rows. Rows are not necessarily community. A community is a circle. Good people around a table or around a coffee table to help you grow and stay connected. Last group of people. We need to connect to Jesus. You know you have not really gone all in with Jesus. You believe in Jesus. You celebrate his birthday. You're here. You're doing your best in learning about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus personally and are truly connected. The Bible tells us demons believe in Jesus, and what good does it do them? It takes more than belief. There should be a moment when we go all in with Jesus, decide to follow Jesus, repent, and then be baptized. Your challenge is repent and then be baptized. We stop from doing it our way and turn to doing it God's way. And baptism is a physical way of saying, I want to connect with Jesus. We don't wait to get our life in order to get connected with Jesus. The only way we will see fruit in our life, good fruit, is when we are connected with Jesus. So if you need to do that, please see me. This is a big decision, but your life depends upon it. Your your marriaging, your parenting. If you're part of this third group of people, and want to know the next step, today is your day. We all have a decision to make today, whether it's to connect with Jesus, stepping up to, to lead or reconnect to Jesus. Just take a minute to be honest with yourself and with God regarding your decision. Let us pray. Creator, sometimes we think we can do it by ourselves. And sometimes we can convince ourselves that we've done a lot by ourselves. But we need you. We need you to produce the fruit in our lives to show other people who you are the true vine, the good shepherd, the life and the resurrection. Lord, we come before you and and help us to be honest. Help us to recognize where we are and step up and take the challenge to grow as your disciple. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Please rise as you are able and join us in singing our closing hymn today, number 397 in the United Methodist hymnal, I Need Thee Every Hour.
go forth in his name and always aiming for true north. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.